Hey everybody, it's Brandon from the Bantu Sun, and I'm just stopping by to drop some of my Bantu scents. So I had came across some videos of just being out in the, the sphere, learning about subjects and getting different perspectives. I really like to hear some critical thinking and some views that may be contrary to my own. But I came across one major player in the field, and it was just interesting on, on, on some of the Bible that was coming out and what really caught me off guard was the person said Japan was historically a naval power I don't know what history this is and I wanted to <laughs> this is me this is the type of person I am when I hear something like this and now this is why I want to share this with you for two reasons one let's c c correct this this policy for most of history and anybody that got our global learning sets, they'll, they can recite this as well. So in the Asia series, we group up China, the Koreas, and Japan into a, a cultural or a summary of a region, which we call East Asia. And we define this region by the preference of being isolated. There, historically, these were hermit kingdoms. Outside of maybe their initial expansion amongst themselves and consolidating the core of their nation states, these re regions or this region and the units within this region, they shunned the outside world. Remember that the Chinese, they built the Great Wall. After the, the great, great selling of Amrozay fleet, they burnt the ships and it reached as far as Africa. And some people were even rumored to say the Americas. When someone says Japan has historically been a naval power, naval power is about maritime security, right? You have to get to other places. You're going to other places. You're protect, protecting trade from other places. So these kingdoms being insular, that's not really coinciding with that idea. Most I can think of is South Korea um, in a little bit. Uh, of some of their ancient kingdoms may have had some the, the turtle ships and but uh some naval power but mostly this was meant to be coastal these weren't fleets selling the world imposing their will such you'll see with the, the british navy throughout the centuries it's even when the mongols invaded japan they were destroyed not by the japanese navy but by a typhoon the, the divine wind from the great god kamikaze like the kamikaze that does the divine wind the whole purpose of the mongols invading and getting their ship destroyed at sea not by the ships of japan but by the divine wind speaks to japan did not have a strong navy um they were ready for their coastal defense so i wanted to, to straight out that policy you really don't see japan engage in a global way until the opening of japan by commodore Matthew Perry in the late 19th uh, century. And then the Japanese in their divine, in their, in their discipline and their understanding of uh, appreciation and understanding of their culture and their achievement for excellence, they took it really personally. And they say, you know, anything that these, these Westerners can do, we can do better. And that's when they really went into the world, sent scholars into the world and students to learn about who were, uh, how to be great army, how to be a great Navy, they learned their soldiery from, from Germany. They learned their, their seamanship from the British. They sent students to universities in America. Like this is when the Japanese went out and it really portends it, as I would believe, the, the rise of Asia, which we're now seeing, is that this historic center of great cultural unity and beauty being challenged by the more assertive and aggressive Western nations and how they rise to try to overcome that. And of course, it just makes them behave just as the, the Westerners. And a lot of imperialism in Asia, when the Europeans were bogged down fighting each other, the Japanese were running them up. Um, from the, some people would consider the invasion of China uh, in the early 1930s to be the true beginning of World War II. And then later stages of World War II, they just go completely ape bonkers. They, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor and running the mud throughout Southeast Asia. So that's where you, where you see the Japanese come, come to their own. But you got to remember, the reason why this is so important is because Japan wasn't to that level. It was 
foot on the gas pedal and a lesson in development, I mind you, of how the Japanese got to such that to that level where they're sitting at Versailles during peace negotiations. Um, this is the, the point of, of history. And, and this is the second point I want to stress. And this is why this is such a, a major issue to me. One, of course, throughout most of history, Japan was not a superior or a naval power period, let alone a superior naval power. Second, I want to stress, history is not a fact. History is a series of facts agreed upon, but it's a series of facts spun into a narrative. As the saying goes, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you do watch the news, you're misinformed. This is the role of history, right? The press is there to influence you. As a critical or analytical thinker or as a global or geopolitical thinker, our responsibility is to take macro facts from a, series, from a wide range of areas put it together in something cogent, and then we create a narrative that's advantageous to us, just as though the powers that be and the other people that have massive influence use history to cite precedent and create a narrative that works for them. And I want to reiterate this point. What I'm telling you is not to tell you what to think, but I'm exposing to you how I think, how I grab facts, and how I put them together in a narrative. Right. One of the reasons that I'm highly concerned about um, NATO getting regime change in Russia is them bringing Russia on board is because I've seen what Europeans do with unfettered uh, power with a homogeneous mindset. And it's historically speaking, I'm not I'm not disparaging Europeans. I'm citing precedent. So when I do that, I'm just saying, OK, well, how can we mitigate this or prepare for this in a better way? Or there's actions that we can take currently that can better influence the outcome of the result. But I'm not telling others what they should think. Some people, Russia, for a lot of people, obviously, Russia uh, having a regime change, being more aligned with the West, is very favorable to them. They like the way that sounds. So you have four nuclear powers um, on the same side. Four, that's 80% of the UN Security Council going in the same direction with China on the outs. So it's their narrative because it's Terrence telling a story or they're using the facts to promote their interests. And it comes back to what I always say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about this is an interest-based world. And it's no reason to try to change that or not that. It's plenty of reason to try to understand that and work with that in, in the realms of what you're trying to accomplish. So one, be careful what people say. Even credible people, uh, they don't, nobody's infallible. And just be shrewd and understand your facts. Because we live now in the 21st century. And most people know what they know because of he said, she said, he said, she said, he said, she said from the original source. So if you ever did scholarly research, actually try to read the documentations or understand it. You know, you, scholarly Scholarly research or scholarly research is extremely difficult and extremely niche because you have to be so well versed in that subject to understand what the heck is going on. And on top of that, just like we have 8 billion people today with 8 billion different points of views, you're only you're not recovering what's available for us to use is not a universal truth. It's the, the truth or the opinion or perceptive of a person. And what we try to do is collate these various views into a defined uh, narrative. But as I said, the narrative is going to fit what people are trying to convey. You know, we can look at the American occupation, uh, the European occupation of the United States as the greatest thing in history or as the worst thing in history. And it's all dependent on what kind of narrative you're trying to, what you're trying to push. So I don't, I try not to get caught up with, like I said, good, bad, these words I've rarely come across universal good and universal bad, right? But what I have come across is the ability to identify opportunities, probably to avoid risk. This is asset management. This is risk management. It's in based on understanding what you're looking for, what you're trying to accomplish, and, and what you want. But the truth behind that will be not what is good or bad. It's what's advantageous, what's disadvantageous. And that's kind of more of the mindset that 
that I approach is, is this advantageous for this act to happen or is it disadvantageous for this act to happen? And I find that to be a lot more functional than designating angels and demons. But that's my thoughts. So <laughs> let me know what you think. Please like, share, subscribe if you enjoy the content. I'd like to hear what you guys think. Till next time, take care. Man, two up.